Good morning, Sky Bridge. Good morning. As you see, we're Good already morning. getting our worship and our praise on yes. this morning. Yes. Hallelujah to your name. Well, welcome to Sky Bridge this morning. Everyone that's on Facebook Live and everyone that's here in the house of the saint in the sanctuary, even right now. We pray that everyone had a blessed and safe uh, Christmas. And everybody understand the reason for the season. Our Lord and Savior, hallelujah. hallelujah. Well, I have a scripture that I want to share with you this morning. It's coming from Psalms 13. It's the last two verses, and it says, But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully yes. with me. Uh -huh. Lord, we just thank you thank for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for who you are. We thank you because you are the most gracious and merciful God. So Father God, how excellent and trustworthy is your name. Great of all things, faithful in your promises, our comforter, infinite in all your wisdom, who presides over everything as we are gathered in your sanctuary today. Lord, we thank you continue to guide us to do your will. Lord, we thank you for you have provided to us your son, who is our advocate, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, the bread of life, our deliverer and redeemer. So Lord, as we move forward in this service to Father God, we ask that you open up our hearts and open up our minds to receive the praise that you so dearly deserve. Lord, we thank you, dear Father God, because you woke us up this morning. You started, up, started us on our way. You have given us new mercy today. So, Lord, we ask that you touch the angel of our house even right now, the one that you have called to provide your word today, dear Father God, and let that word not be void. And go and touch someone that do not know the saving knowledge of your precious son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for this dying world that we are living in right now. We pray for the decisions of our leaders, dear Father God. The good and the bad, dear Father God, we ask that you touch their hearts to, for them to make the right decisions for your sheep. Lord, we know right now we're going through some things where uh, things need to be signed or should have been signed. Dear Father God, to help your people, but for some reason the heart just wasn't there. Lord, we know coming this Tuesday, dear Father God, there's another signature that's needed so the government won't shut down. So Lord, we ask, even right now, we're praying that you make a way out of no way. We see sometimes there's, there's no hope, but Lord, as we look up to you, we know that you have already provided so much to us, dear Father God that you continue to provide. You said in your word that you will not leave us or forsake us. So Lord, we're holding on to that promise because you will not. Lord, we thank you, dear Father God, because so many people have lost hope. Let them know, dear Father God, that you're right there with your open arms, loving them, caring for us, protecting us. Even when it seems like it's not, we know that you're there. So, Lord, as we move forward in this day, into this week, into this month, into the new year, we ask for your loving arms and protection. Cover us right now, dear Father. We thank you once again for your mercy. We thank you once again for your grace. We thank you once again for your love. We thank you once again for your guidance. We thank you. And we can't not continue to thank you enough. We can thank you a thousand times, a million times, dear Father God. We know that you're still God and God all by yourself. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen. We are here to celebrate our Lord. We are here to worship him and praise him because he's worthy, because he is good. Amen. How many of you know that God is good? Anybody know good. God is good? Can you help us sing out there? You can do this. Sing, dance. Let it go. Just worship him. You are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are 
good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and time, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you Yes, 
you are. Yes, he is. We just celebrated the Christmas season and how our Savior was born and, and what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful season it is, how we celebrate him. Isn't it good news that we have Emmanuel with us always? Amen? Amen. Amen. God is so good. Father God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. We worship you. Yes, we do.
because you are worthy to be praised, we have entered into your house of worship one more time. And we give you glory and praise just for who you are. On top of that, Lord, we give you glory and praise for what you have done for us. We can't help it, but this is that time of the season where we celebrate your incarnation, how you came to redeem a lost mankind, how we messed up a long time ago, and we continue to mess up, and you continue to extend your mercy. I heard Minister Hardiman say earlier today, dear God, that your mercies are new every day, and we need your mercy new this day. So now, Lord, we have come to that moment in our worship where we go through the text, and we listen now, we lifted up praise to you. Now we need to hear a word from heaven. So speak to us, Lord. Speak to us in a way that we will hear from you, that our eyes may see you clearer, that our ears may hear you better, and that our hearts may be receptive to this gospel message. Now thank you for this praise team. Thank you for this, these musicians. Thank you for our audio team. Thank you, dear Lord, for those who join us through way of live streaming through Facebook Live and those who will be listening delayed later on through our YouTube channel. We bless you already for who you are and for what you are going to say this morning. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas to everybody. Good morning. It is good to see your faces in the house this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me in the book of Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 25, all the way through verse 35. We got a long passage of reading this morning, but it's connected with everything we've been talking about for the last few Sundays as we walk through the genealogy of Christ and Matthew for the last three Sundays. We want to pick up on a different area but still dealing with Jesus' birth. I'm excited to hear that we got an organ now. I didn't know we had one. I, 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 didn't know we could, I didn't know we could do that. I didn't know we could do that. We got Sister Benita back in the house, Sister Beverly back in the house. God bless you. And y'all didn't know it. Maybe y'all didn't pay a lot of attention, but Sister Howlton is singing out there in the congregation and push me out the row. I don't know if you I, I had to get out the way because she was getting her praise on. Luke chapter 2, verse number 25. Listen to this. It says this. Now, just in case you thought Christmas was over, the birth is over, but the celebration goes on. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation. And consolation means comfort. Comfort. Tell your neighbor, it means comfort. I'm already preaching. It means comfort for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when his parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel and his father and his mother marveled at what he said about him and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother behold this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own souls also, so that thought from many hearts will be revealed. I want to talk to us this morning from the topic, waiting for the consolation of Jesus. Waiting for the consolation of Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, this morning, pastor is going to talk about waiting 
for the consolation of Jesus. Amen. As you take your seats, and to those many of you who are visiting us, we found out streaming, and so many people have touched us in one way or the other to let us know that you are streaming us from different parts of the United States. And I got a text message from our brother uh, who visited with us from Uganda, and he has been tracking us as well. So I'm excited to know that the word of God is reaching around the world. Amen. Has anybody ever had to wait on anything that you really wanted in life? This We're all waiting on something, always, always. We're always waiting on something. It, it seems like we spend much of our lives waiting. We have waiting rooms, wait lines. We wait to be seated. We wait on the phone. We wait for tickets. We wait to enroll our children. We even wait on vacation to get into our theme parks and to our destinations. In America today, we're waiting for the president and Congress to make a decision. We're waiting for vaccinations for COVID-19 virus. We're waiting for a fractured government to stop playing around with our lives and to pass legislation that provides relief for everybody. We are waiting for the president to stop tweeting and to start leading. We're waiting for the police to universally treat people of color the same way as they treat white citizens. We're waiting, I tell you, on equal access to quality health care for everybody. We are waiting for our white Christian brothers and sisters of faith to be woke from their Americanized Eurocentric view of scripture and to recognize that the scriptures were composed and given to the Middle East and Africa nations and not to Middle America. And if you argue with me about that, go read this book by Dr. Soon Cha Ra's outstanding book entitled The Next Evangelicalism from 2009. Sometimes it seems that all we do is wait. The tough part about waiting is we never know how long the wait is going to be. You ever try going to the Department of Public Safety to get your driver's license? You ever try to go through the line that says 10 items or less? And everybody has 10 items or less. You ever try waiting in a doctor's office? And they tell you to be there at such a time and you're there? Early. <laughs> but you're still waiting. Ah! But there are things that's worth waiting for. I don't think I'm alone by myself this morning. I, there are some things worth waiting for. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord and be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. So this morning, I invite you and me to continue this Christmas story, this saga, this great event, and look at a man by the name of Simeon who waited his, listen, he didn't wait 15 minutes. He didn't have to wait for two hours and wait for a number to call his name. He waited his entire life for something, and it was definitely worth waiting for. I want to share with us waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Jesus. How did we get here? How did we get to this point in the text? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are basically four guys in the Bible named Simeon, but this Simeon, lived in Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago at a time when people were looking for the Messiah, the anointed one, the redeemer, the savior of the world. And scripture revealed it was close. It was close. But no one could really pinpoint the exact day that Jesus would show up, that he would arrive on the scene. But they knew that the scriptures pointed that he was going to come. After Adam and Eve sinned, God prophesied to them. 
that the Messiah would be born of a woman. And this prophecy was given by God himself. Uh, it was where he said in the scripture in Romans, or rather in Genesis, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we began the waiting process. I'm talking about waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Jesus. We needed comfort because man had messed up what God had created. Isaiah prophesied, he said, how Jesus would come into the human history. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and, and, and he will bear a son and, and shall, you shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Still, humanity is waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Jesus. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 prophesied that Jesus would be born in a town called Bethlehem. Still, the world was waiting for the consolation of Jesus. Malachi prophesied, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. The messenger of whom Malachi spoke, though, was John the Baptist. However, the Jews still are waiting on the consolation of Jesus. In Matthew, where we had been reading for the last three Sundays, it revealed that Isaiah's prophecy had finally come true. Everything that we've been looking for. Isn't that like Christmas? Everything that you have been hoping for. All the kids and the parents and the, and the people have been waiting for that great day and it finally showed up. And the scripture says in Matthew 1, and following, all this took place. All what? All of the prophecy and everything that was happening in Matthew, it all took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And this single act was the fulfillment of God's promise to come fix what we messed up a long time ago. And I know, I hear you, a lot of people get mad and they say, well, pastor, I didn't do anything. That happened then. Yeah, but Adam and Eve acted as the federal head of the human race. So if they did well, the whole human race did well. If they sinned, and they did, then by their actions, the whole human race sinned. So we're in a predicament. We're in a problem. We're in a situation where we need some comfort. We need some peace. We need some resolve from all the mess-ups in the world. I am sick and tired of turning on TV and getting nothing but bad news. There's fires in the West and hurricanes dancing up through the Gulf of Mexico. There is poverty. There are long lines of people working for food. There are long lines of people being furloughed and kicked off their jobs. I'm telling you, we're looking for some consolation, some comfort, some peace in our lives, waiting for the consolation of Jesus. Today we learn what it means though to wait for something that has eternal worth, something that has lasting value, and it gives us hope and help that God hasn't forgotten about us. I'm talking about waiting for the consolation of Jesus. So if you've ever been disgusted by the politics of today, or if you've ever been tired and frustrated with somebody or something in your life, or if you've ever been delayed, uh, had delayed gratification for the progress on your job, progress in your finances, progress in your health, I'm telling you, we're going to learn today about waiting for the consolation of Jesus. I believe in this text, we find an obscure man that we haven't heard of before. This particular Simeon doesn't give us history about himself. We're not sure where he comes from. We don't know who his people are. All of a sudden, we see that Jesus was born. Mary and Joseph now takes the son, as is customary, to the temple to dedicate him back to God. Parents, 
you ought to dedicate your children to the Lord. But dedicating your children to the Lord means bringing them to church, not sending them to church. There's a difference. It means that mama and daddy are first dedicated to the Lord because you can't dedicate something you don't believe in. You can't dedicate a child to a God that you don't serve yourself. They brought him to the temple. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, we read that Simeon. Wait a minute. There is no introduction. There is no Simeon, uh, the offspring of so-and-so. You remember that long lineage we read in Matthew? There's no lineage there. Suddenly, there's just a guy named Simeon who's at the temple. And here we go. We follow this guy. But Simeon has a message for you and for I and for me. First of all, I'm going to give you three things that we can take home with us. I want you to notice, first of all, look at the character of Simeon. Look at the character of Simeon. Verse 25 says this, now, see, there's the suddenness, suddenly, now there's a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and... It had been revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That's amazing. That's amazing by itself. First of all, I want you to look at the character of this man. First, notice this. He's living in Jerusalem. That's all we know about him. He's living in Jerusalem at a time when Christ had been born living in the hub, if you will, the center of political and religious activity for the Jews. Secondly, we notice this about him. His name is Simeon. Now, check this out. His name means God has heard. Tell your neighbor, God has heard. Just in case you think that you're waiting in vain, just in case you think that your prayers didn't get past the ceiling, just in case you think the turmoil that's going on with COVID-19 and your prayers to the Lord had not been heard, he gives us a message today called Simeon, whose name means God has heard. I heard you. I heard you last night. I heard you this morning. I heard you last month. I heard you last night. I heard you a few moments ago. Aren't you glad God has heard? Ah, uh, I, I, in other words, I haven't forgotten about your tears on your pillow. I haven't forgotten about your prayers in the midnight hour. God has heard. His name is Simeon. Just when we're going through a difficult time in our lives, when this young, scared young couple have uh, brought into life this baby. And the only way they can understand the baby is an angel had to show up and tell Mary, Mary, you're going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit and you're going to carry the Christ child. And she sitting here going like, wait a minute, wait, 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 what? Over here, Joseph, the, one that you, the woman that you espoused to marry and y'all ain't had sex yet. She pregnant. But don't trip, Joseph. Now the baby's here. And this young couple is doing the best they can, I believe. Put yourself in their mindset. You're living in Nazareth. But you go to give birth in Bethlehem. And now you're going to the temple. And in your background, the scripture's not saying it, but you know how people are. There they go. That little couple, you know, they've been out there doing the nasty, and they ain't even married. And, and, and she said it ain't, it ain't Joseph's, and Joseph said it ain't his. You notice there was scandal dancing around them? And yet, they are obeying the Lord, and they are following the custom of, well, the baby's here, now what are we going to do? We're going to carry on, because the Lord has given us a sign. And so they bring the baby to the temple, and they meet a guy by the name of Simeon. So we find out he, Simeon is from Jerusalem. We find out his name means God has heard. 
Thirdly, we find out something about his spiritual characteristic. We, we find out that he is a just and devout man. To be a just man means that he is fair and impartial. And, and, and what he says, he means. Have you ever found anybody like that? Oftentimes, we find somebody just the opposite. They may say one thing, but everything out their mouth is a lie. You can't trust them. But this is a trustworthy man. He is a just man. You can hold him to his word. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's just with other people. But not only that, but it says, and he's devout. He's devout. In other words, he, he, what he says about the Lord, you can hang your hat on. He, he is loyal and trustworthy. He's a devout man. He's obedient to the word of the Lord. He understood that his obedience was required. Listen, let me, let me help somebody with this. Obedience is a prerequisite to be used by the Lord. God can't use somebody who ain't going to listen to him and obey. Uh, how many of you know that, that there are so many preachers who are f- by the wayside? The pulpits have been desecrated because too many of us preachers, we hear the word, we preach the word, but we don't always live the word. And then God has to snatch us out before we mess up everybody else. No, he needed a man by the name of Simeon who not only heard God's word, but was obedient to God's word. And that's hard to do because we are still humans and we're being pulled and tugged in every direction. I'm not making excuses. I'm saying what happens. And when we mess up, we pay a penalty too. Isn't it interesting? James 1.22 tells us that God blesses and, regard, and, and rewards obedience. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Then it says it like this, do what it says. Do what it says. Fourthly, the fourth thing we learn about this man, Simeon, in verse number 25, it says, and he was waiting. He was waiting. I'm going to say something. It's one thing to know what God has said. It's another thing to wait according to God's calendar. And we're some impatient people. Do I have a witness in the house? We are so impatient that when it comes to traffic, green means go. Red means stop. Yellow means I can't wait. I'm going to go faster. Because we are impatient. We don't want to wait. Because in our minds, we figure if I go on through the yellow, I can get there faster. We don't want to wait. We're some impatient people, I tell you. We're always rushing somewhere. That's why we go through the the, the 10 hour or less, I'm sorry, the 10 item or less line with 50 items. Because we don't want to get in the correct line because we don't want to wait. So here we go through and the lady look at us and she going, and and have you seen their faces? I've done it. I've, I've done it, and I've seen people ahead of me. And you're standing there, and the, the sign says, 10 items or less. And you got a basket full. And, the, and the, they must have been trained differently at HEV because used to be they would tell, I'm sorry, this is 10 items or less. You need to go over there. At HEV now, they just see you coming, and the girl just go like, really? That's a basket full. It's a basket full. I know you got 157 items in there, but it, come on, come on, come on. And then you look at them funny because they don't have enough bags for all the stuff you just brought over. Ten items or less, I'm trying to tell you. So we don't want to wait. We don't want to wait on anybody else. We don't, listen, we don't even want to wait on God. Sometimes... That's what God calls us to do. And listen, I think sometimes God makes us wait to see the measure of our faith. In other words, if I give it to you right away, you might do it. But you might do it for the wrong reasons. But if I make you wait, then I know that you're listening to me and you are moving according to my calendar, according to my calculation, according to my watch. How many of you know God ain't interested 
the, and the fact that you just flipped the calendar from December to January or from January to February, he said, that's cute, but that's still not my timing, and that is not my will. God's timing and God's instruction is everything. So don't get ahead of God. If he ain't told you to move out, then sit still and wait. There are too many of us who move out quickly. I've heard people say dumb stuff to me like, well, I told the Lord. I know we're in trouble right there when they start that sentence off. I told the Lord that if he don't give me a sign, then he must want me to marry her because I think she the one. And if I don't hear from God by midnight tonight, I'm going to go and propose and we're going to go get married. Who told you to give God a timeline? God may have been holding off on her because she crazy. Or you crazy. I told y'all we would have got married sooner if Linda had gotten straight. God was trying to get her right. Actually, God was making me and her wait. We both had gotten tired of playing the dating game. We, we compared notes when we finally did get married. And I asked God, I said, Linda, why did you not talk to me when I tried to talk to you. She said, because I was tired of the games. And I needed to make sure that it was the right time and I needed God to bring the right person. And I said the same thing. You ever been tired of, of us trying to move ahead of God? And then we go to the same wrong places looking for that right spouse. How are you going to find the right spouse looking in the wrong places? You're tired of being single, but there's some things that can be worse than being single. And some of you sitting there going like, well, Reverend, I'm married now. Well, God bless you. Now you got to wait on God to get him or her right because you got him now. You got to deal with him. Psalm 1-3 says, that person that waits on the Lord and his timing and does things according to the way the Lord says it for us to do it. Listen, listen, what the psalmist says, Psalm 1-3. He says, that person, that person is a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. In other words, but you got to wait. Listen, you don't get peaches in the wintertime. You don't get watermelon in the, in the wintertime. You got to wait for summer to come back around in God's timing. And while you wait, tilling the soil, while you wait, keep watering the soil. While you wait, you got to keep giving sunshine to that soil. While you wait, I'm talking about waiting for the consolation of Christ. The New Testament waiting was essential as well. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, after Jesus' crucifixion, the, the disciples are, are, are in the upper room, and Jesus had given them instructions. He said, now, y'all stay up there. And wait until the Holy Spirit comes. Because when he comes, he's going to endure you with power. Because right now, if you move out, you ain't going to be ready for what you encounter. Wait in the upper room. Ah, and while they were gathered together, Acts 1-4, while they were gathered together, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Uh, uh, for the gift of the Father promised, which you have heard me discuss. That was the waiting of the Holy Spirit. The fifth thing we learn about Simeon is this, that the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was a holy man uh, 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 and, and was divinely inspired to trust in the Messiah's appearance, appearing. In other words, Lord, I just believe that you're going to come through and you're going to make this happen. Talking about waiting for the consolation of Jesus. So we see the, the character of Simeon. Secondly, if you're keeping notes, here's the other thing I want you to take note of. Look at the revelation to Simeon. The revelation to Simeon, verse 26 and following. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Isn't that pretty direct and clear? 
Wouldn't it be interesting if God told you the sun is not going to go down on you today until I do this, whatever this is for you? I would be so, I would jump out my skin if something like that happened where God says, today, Russell, this is going to happen before the sun goes down today. You and I would be sitting there and we wouldn't hardly be able to move. Is it now, Lord? Is it now? Is it now? If somebody came into our life, if the phone ring, if we got a text message or a phone call or, or email, is it now, Lord? Is that it? We would be sitting on the edge of our seats in anticipation that every blow of the wind, every move of the sun, every bird that flew overhead was God's sign that he is now answering that particular prayer. And yet, here it is right here. He says, he says Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, you're not going to see death. You're not going to die until Jesus is showing up in physical form in front of you. You're not going to die until that happens. So look at what we find out about this passage, this short passage. It says that the Holy Spirit communicated with Simeon. Now, we don't know how the Holy Spirit did it because we're not told in this passage. We could only kind of gather bits and pieces by how the Lord has moved in other parts of the Bible. But what we do know is it was not in a dream. It was not in a dream like the wise men were warned. Remember the wise men were warned in a dream after they had seen Jesus? They said he sent them back another way so that they wouldn't encounter Herod the king so that Herod couldn't go and kill the Christ child. Uh, it wasn't by an angel because the scripture didn't tell us it was by an angel. Remember it took an angel to talk to Joseph and it took an angel to talk to Mary but the scripture didn't say it came by an angel. And it wasn't by a voice. The scripture didn't say. And Simeon heard a voice from heaven say, go. No, it wasn't a voice. As in Old Testament times when God would speak directly to Moses. I would love to live in time like that, wouldn't you? Would you like to get up in the morning and you say a prayer to the Lord and he says something like, Beverly, go thou now. To such and such. You would, I, I would, I would, first of all, after I get up off the floor, after I get up off the floor, because you know, I that would that would mess you, that would that would change your day. That 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 would change your day. Vincent. Lord, Lord, is that you? If the Lord spoke audibly, but the scripture does not say that it said that. But all we can assume here or presume here is he impressed upon uh, Simeon's mind to get up and to go to church. Get up and go to the temple. In other words, Simeon, something's getting ready to go down and you need to be at the temple. Uh, it, he impressed something upon Simeon's mind that he should not see death until the Messiah comes. Secondly, the Messiah called Simeon to do something. He, he, he made Simeon do three things in this text. And if you read too quickly, you'll miss it. One, he called Simeon to go to church. <laughs> it said he came to the temple. Two, he picked up the child. And three, he blessed the Lord. Let's see it here. Verse 27, he came. In the spirit, ah, he came according to the leading of the spirit, if you will, into the temple. How many of you just come to church, just come into church because it's Sunday? How many of you get here and have an attitude? Well, it was all right, but they didn't sing my favorite song. Or they sang it, but so-and-so sang it, and so-and-so should have sang it because that's her song. Who said that was her song? And see, you came in with the wrong attitude. You should have came in clapping your hands and bringing joy and, and, and celebration of God, but you came in critiquing the choir. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You didn't come in the spirit. You just came in the door. <laughs> Somebody need to hear me this morning. He came, and when? The parents brought the child to do for him according to the custom of the law. 
the scripture says Simeon took the child. First of all, the man came to the temple. Why go to church? Why go to the temple? Because the doors are open. And listen, that's where social gatherings are. But that's also where Christians gather and bless each other. That's where relationships are formed and fellowship happens at the temple. Also, why do you go to church? Because that's where we hold each other accountable. I can't hold you accountable if you're not there. You can't hold me accountable if I'm not there. Why go to church? Because at church, we encourage each other. You can make it. You can get through this. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray for you. Your car broken? I'll loan you my other car. I'll pick you up. We encourage each other. We help each other. But you can't get help when you stay home. I heard too many people say, are we the church? Yes, the people are the church. Well, I can worship at home, but I don't know what you're going through, and I can't help you. And Satan likes to pick us off one by one when we stay alone. Stop making those excuses. He says, forsake not the assembling of the saints. Why go to church? Why go to church? Because at the church, at the temple, we can share our experiences, our needs, our prayers, and yes, our praise. You ever get your praise on? And then people want to know what's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? It's not what's wrong, it's what's right. When God has answered your prayer and you've had a breakthrough in your finances, have a breakthrough in your health, had a breakthrough in some situation in your life. But you do that when you come to the temple and you worship with other people. And then secondly, the other thing that Simeon did is he picked up the child. He saw the baby and he picked up the child. It was customary for Mary and Joseph to bring him to the temple, but he picked up the child and he looked at the child. Now, isn't that remarkable? That's remarkable. God, by the Holy Spirit, urged him to go to church, to go to the temple. And when he gets there, he encounters Jesus. But he didn't encounter Jesus the way you and I encounter Jesus. I mean, he encountered Jesus. There Jesus is. And he looks upon him. And by the leading of the Holy Spirit, he realized this is the one I've been waiting on. This is the one promised by Isaiah. This is the one promised in Genesis. This is the one promised by Micah. This is the manifestation of the Christ that was to come. Yes, waiting on the consolation of Jesus. This is the one I would hang my hat on. This is the one I would have waited all day long if I needed to and through the night. This is the waiting Messiah, the, the, the promised Messiah that I've been waiting on all my life. Those who may have laughed at me made fun of me, mocked me. Here he is, and I'm holding the Messiah who will one day hold me. I'm carrying the Messiah who will one day carry my sins on the cross. I am now looking at the Messiah who would one day look at me in glory. Here he is. It's remarkable, I tell you. Uh, this abundant satisfaction right in front of his life. Listen, we have found temporary satisfaction. Temporary satisfaction. When we finally get that diploma and we have graduated. Temporary. We finally get some temporary satisfaction when we get a car that runs. Temporary. We finally get temporary satisfaction when the doctor says, that's the last chemotherapy you got to do. Your cancer is gone. Temporary. We finally get temporary satisfaction uh, uh, in every, every area of our lives. But this is eternal satisfaction. Waiting on the Christ child. Waiting on the one who would redeem us. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 5 says, if my house we're not right with God. Surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant uh, 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 and arranged and secured in every part. Surely 
He would not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire. Uh, what he is saying here is because my house is right, <laughs> because my faith is right, because my walk is right, God has uh, given me an everlasting covenant with him. And he has shown me the manifestation of this covenant. I'm talking about waiting on the consolation of Jesus Christ. Every person has unique desires, wishes, and dreams in their lives that you want to come true. That produces unspeakable feelings of joy and excitement when they come to pass. Men finally saw Jesus, the actual physical human baby Jesus, and recognized him as the Messiah. And when Simeon saw the baby Jesus, he had the can't help it. He picked him up and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. In other words, I can die now. Have you ever heard somebody say they, they got something or they were waiting on something? Well, and you'll, you'll talk about it in jest. As a girlfriend to another girlfriend or a dude to another dude, you say, man, that's worth dying for. Well, this <laughs> was worth dying for. He's saying to himself, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. In other words, whatever happens from this day on, no matter what happens, no matter what kind of news comes out of Washington, no matter what kind of news comes out of the bank, no matter what kind of news comes out of my doctor's office, I'm at peace. I'm going to be all right because I've seen the consolation of Jesus. My eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of everybody, everybody, a light and a revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for the people of Israel. This is a shout. This is not just him reading the text. This is a shout. You need to know when to shout. This is not one of those conversations when you had a baby and you call your friend up. You don't call people up after you didn't have a baby and say, well, we had a baby. No. You call and you give details. Yeah, we had a boy. We had a girl. She weighed this much. Her eyes are already open. She's doing this and that. She weighed this much and he was this long and the doctors are happy and I'm happy and he got 10 fingers and 10 toes. This is a shout. This is just not a statement that we read casually. This is a shout. Today, I got to hold Jesus. <laughs> Today, I got to hold the creator who made me. I got to hold Jesus in my arms. Ah, ah, this is better, Vince, than Super Bowl tickets. Uh, this is better, Paul, than a hole in one when you're playing golf. This is better than hitting a home run. This is better than front row seats at the Broadway production of Hamilton. I'm telling you, this is great. I got to hold Jesus. How many people do you know in the Bible, other than mama and daddy, Mary and Joseph can say, I got to hold Jesus. This is a shout, I tell you. This is not just one of those little phrases you read through in the Bible. It's a, it's a shout. I've been waiting a long time. And I'm an old man now, but I got to hold Jesus. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his command. Waiting for the consolation of Jesus. Lastly, not only do we see the, the character of Simeon, not only do we see the revelation of Simeon, but lastly, we see the prophecy of Simeon. In other words, I, I got what I 
came for. I don't know if y'all got what y'all came for. I don't know if y'all got at church what I came for. When I came to temple, this, I didn't know I was going to get all this today. I, I knew that God was faithful and he would keep his word. I just didn't know it was going to be today. But I had to go to the temple. Listen, some of you are streaming right now and you're sitting there rolling your eyes and smacking your lips. And you've been, you've been putting church up. I can go next Sunday. I'll go next Sunday. Now, we live in a time where we can't go to church. We can't go in fellowship with other believers. Now, I understand that we are the church. I got that. But we were designed by God to live in community. We were designed by God to live with other people. That's why now, I believe so many people are sneaking off, trying to go hang out with their friends, sneaking off, going to hang out with family during vacation times when the pandemic is raging like wildfire and people say, stay home for now. You know why it's so hard to stay home? Because we're not designed to live by ourselves. We were designed to live in community. That's how we're made. And so we have to make ourselves quarantine, make ourselves isolate. We have to make ourselves do those things because we were made to worship together. And now for all those people who stayed home and didn't come, so many people wish they could come to church, wish they could come to temple. Let me tell you, when you do have the opportunity to go back to church, you better worship like it's crazy, it's like it's your last time. Worship like Simeon. Worship like you just held Jesus in your arms. You ought to be here before the pastor get here. You ought to be here before the preacher or the deacon can unlock the doors. You ought to be here before the praise team can start singing. You ought to be here worshiping and letting people come in as though you were an usher. You ought to be the first one in the parking lot and the last one to leave because you don't know what God is getting ready to do, but you need to be in the temple. We see the prophecy of Simeon. He says in verse 31 and following, he says, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light of revelation to the Gentiles and of glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled. Mary and Joseph, now listen, Mary and Joseph have been through some miraculous stuff. They didn't have angels talking to them. They had a star followed and come and lighted, lit over where their baby was. And yet, here he is. Standing in front of this man, Simeon, got a promise from the Lord to show up to the temple. He is now prophesying, and the scripture says, and they marveled. What? How? It's almost as though how much more can this young couple take? And yet, here he is sharing some good news to them in verse 31 and 32. Simeon still excited about the fact that he just held Jesus, reveals that salvation and truth would be available to the entire world. Yes, Jesus, born, uh, uh, parents from Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, but he would be a light, a revelation to the whole world. He came because the scripture makes it clear in New Testament, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, whosoever. And let me say something to the evang American evangelical church. Stop limiting what God can do, thinking God came only to sa save America and Israel. No, he came to save people in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, and people in the Philippines and Japan, and people in Mexico and in Canada, and people in Australia and New Zealand, and people in Zimbabwe and, 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 and in South Africa. Stop acting like. We got the market on salvation. God came that everybody might be saved. I know I'm right about it. There's some things in Scripture you ought to be sure about. That's one of them. He came that everybody might be saved. Not just you and not just people that look like you, but people all over the world might be saved. All they have to do is call on the name of the Lord. 
Yes, Simeon understood that Jesus came to be a light to the Gentiles to be, bring light to us. He would be the suffering servant dying on a cross and then raised from the dead. And, and, and how thankful we ought to be. We ought to be as excited as Simeon that he died for us, got up for us, lives for us. But Simeon's not done. He next turns to bless his parents, Joseph and Mary, and he tells them in Luke 2, 34 and 35, the words of Simeon to Mary, he now turns to mama and let mama know, mama, mama, you need to know. God chose you, Mary. Mama, God chose you to carry the Christ child. But mama, you not only carried him in your womb, you're going to have to one day carry him in your heart. Because scripture makes it plain that a sword will pierce your own heart. It's a prophecy of Christ's coming. His crucifix on Calvary's cross would be the most tragic event in Mary's life. It would pierce her heart. I didn't understand then when one of the older sisters of the church tried to tell me and Linda, they said when Jared and Zachary were small, enjoy them now because they are on your lap. Because one day they're going to be grown and gone and they'll just be on your heart. In other words, you won't know what they're doing or getting into, but they're going to be on your heart and you're just going to pray that they're being safe and careful and that nobody is harming your grown baby. Ah, lastly, verse 35b, it's so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What does that mean? That don't make no sense. It seems like Simeon was done after he talked to the parents. But he says, and lastly, he says this, so, and he came so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Let me help us with that. Here he is saying this, Jesus is coming, but everybody ain't going to receive him the way I just, I'm talking as though I'm Simeon. In other words, Simeon is saying, Parents, mama, daddy, everybody ain't going to get to hold Jesus like I just did. Mama, daddy, everybody don't have the same motive that I have. Mama, daddy, some people are going to want to see Jesus because they want to see, like me, the consolation of Israel, the comfort of Israel, that Israel is finally saved, that the world is finally redeemed. Some people will feel like that, but there's another group of people, mama and daddy. Many will come because they don't expect this Jesus to come the way he's coming. See, some people got plans for Jesus. Some people want Jesus to be their earthly ruler to rescue them from Roman rule. They're tired of being ro ro run by the Romans and paying taxes to Caesar. Some of them got ulterior motives, mama and daddy. And then there are some religious leaders, mama and daddy. You see, their hearts are being revealed. Hearts are being revealed. Hearts are being revealed. There are some religious leaders who just don't want him around because of the claims that he make and the deeds that he do, do, will do and the threats to the religious system. Everybody ain't going to love your child the way you love your child. Everybody's not going to receive Jesus the way I just received Jesus. And lastly, there's going to be another one who wants to assassinate your son. And so one day, you're going to find out real soon, you're going to have to pick this child up and run with him to Africa. You're going to have to go to Egypt and hide out there because Herod, that paranoid, egotistical, a narcissistic, crazy man who runs the country is going to try to kill your son, put a hit on your child. You see, his coming reveals the heart of people, those who love his coming, those who have plans for him to rule, those who don't want him around because he messes up their game, and those who just want to get rid of him because of their game going on.
I'm talking about the consolation of Jesus. So in my conclusion, the Bible doesn't say any more about Simeon. That's it. He comes out of nowhere and shows up at the temple by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And after this passage of Scripture, we don't hear about Simeon no more. We don't see him walking down the dusty roads. We don't hear that he moved to Jericho. We don't hear that he moved to a retirement community in Nazareth. We didn't hear that he took up hobbies playing golf. We just don't hear about Simeon no more. He says, now I can depart in peace according to your word in verse number 29. He came out of nowhere, and it seemed like he disappeared into nowhere. But this man, when he left, he left with satisfaction, eternal satisfaction, to know that God keeps his word. What have you been waiting on? Have you been waiting? You still waiting on something? We spend too much of our lives waiting, y'all. We're waiting to finish this. That project in the garage that you said you were going to get done. That waiting on retirement. I'm, I'm going to retire at a certain day. I'm waiting to retire. I'm waiting for groceries. I'm waiting in traffic. I'm waiting for my stimulus check to come in. <laughs> what are you waiting for? Everything that we wait on here is temporal. Temporary satisfaction. I'm telling you, there's some things you ought to wait on that have lasting value. Simeon spent his life expecting Christ's arrival. We ought to spend our lives anticipating Christ's return. Ha! Simeon showed up at the church because he knew Jesus would be there. We ought to show up at the church because Jesus, through his spirit, is here. Jesus is the comfort of all who place their faith in, the, in his salvation. Just as Simeon was an example of staying faithful. When you feel like giving up, staying faithful. Through COVID-19, staying faithful. Even though you've been furloughed by your job, staying faithful. Even though we got corrupt politicians, staying faithful. When the hospitals are full and your loved ones are dying, staying faithful. When there's racial inequality and riots in the streets, stand faithful that ultimately through the person of Jesus Christ, through the personality of Jesus Christ, that there is good news waiting on his time and his timing. You and me right now need to do like Simeon. And we not, may not be able to hold Jesus in our arms, but this morning we can hold him in our hearts because we are his children. We are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are watching this morning and you are streaming, you can have this same Jesus. The Spirit of Christ can move into your heart right now. But you got to believe that Jesus is the, the Messiah, the promised one. How do you do that? Let me give you five things you need to know that you can go home with on this Christmas. Simeon had a Christmas gift. He got to see Jesus. I want to give you a Christmas gift to know that you could receive Jesus, not in your arms, but in your heart. Understand that heaven, Jesus Christ, is a free gift. Secondly, we don't deserve it. We don't earn it because we got sin in our lives. The Bible says everybody has sinned and messed up. But the good news, God loves you but hates your sins. And he bridged that problem for you and me in the person of Jesus Christ. The eternal God, 100% God and 100% man. He had to be man to make up for the man mess ups in Genesis. But he had to be God to get up from the grave with all power and heaven and earth in his hands. And the only way to receive this Christmas gift and to hold this Christmas gift in your heart is to receive it by faith, trusting in Jesus Christ alone. No other way, no additives, no preservatives. In other words, you can't wait and get yourself right before you come to Jesus. Come to him just as you are.
But once you come to him just as you are, you got to change. You can't stay the way you are. But then you'll be able to do like Simon and go and testify and tell somebody else that I've been waiting on the consolation of Jesus. And on this Christmas day or after this Christmas day, I finally understood that I can have comfort. I can have peace. I can lay my head down and sleep tonight because I have the consolation of Christ in my heart. Pray with me if you will. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this testimony from this man named Simeon. Thank you, Lord, for those who just heard these five points that I pray right now that they accept Jesus Christ during this Christmas season into their hearts to know that we all are looking for some comfort. We're all looking for some peace. We're all looking for a better life than what we are going through right now. It's a mess down here. And so, Lord, we turn it all over to you. And we put our hearts in your hand that you would move and put your heart in our hearts and change us, redeem us, adopt us, save us, love us, forgive us, and make us your children. On this day, after the Christmas celebration. And like Simeon, we're going to shout and we're going to tell somebody who don't know you as Savior and Lord, come see a man who told me all about myself and loved me anyway and died for my sins and rose and took me and went back to heaven. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody give God praise in the house. <laughs> Listen, let me give you some announcements before we go home today. Skybridge, don't forget, if people have been asking you, when are y'all going back to church? You tell them that they can Zoom us 9.30 every Sunday. The building is closed, but the church is still open. We need every member to communicate that, and we need you to come out and join us if you can on Saturday, January 23rd at 2 p.m. here in the parking lot. And we're just going to take door hangers, and we're just going to go through the neighborhoods and hang door hangers on doors that keep going. So you don't have to be an a expert evangelist. You just need to have some tennis shoes on and a willingness to go. So meet us here January 23rd, Saturday, January 23rd at 2 p.m. And uh, help us to invite people so that Skybridge can still grow even during a pandemic. All Zoom meetings, all the men's meetings, the women's meetings, youth and children are, 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 are uh, on hold for, for, the, for, for a Christmas break until the new year. Thank God for you for being faithful and for coming in. And, and for those teachers who have been faithful and producing and having classes for you. But we need a break and you need a break. So this is your time to enjoy family and to celebrate your faith. Uh, so stand for them. For those of you who have outdated information, please send us your updated phone numbers, addresses, emails, so that we can communicate with you. And today, we celebrate a birthday for Bridget Jenkins, Sister Jenkins. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. So Merry Christmas to everybody and Happy New Year. Let's stand and get ready to go. Waiting on the consolation of Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word today. Help us to be mindful of all that you have put into us and to remember this story of Simeon and to be like him, to show up, to pick up the baby and then to give a testimony of your grace. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his glorious presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior. Ah! Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. We love you, God. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.